<laughs> well, I think we'll be fine. So, yes, as always, I'm just going to give you a brief summary. Jeremy's going to open the Bible and we'll see why the unit says what it says. I might start by praying. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together. We thank you for your um, all your promises, but especially your promise to be with us uh, by your spirit. And we pray that you would be uh, helping us as we examine your word to understand what it is you would have us know and have us learn and have us proclaim. And we ask this for Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, we are at... Come on. There it is. Unit 9 of 10, the study of the justice of God and therefore justification. So, hmm, where does one begin? Well, one might begin by saying that God is perfectly just. He always does what is right, for he is perfect, and that is who he is. And so, in that, for that reason, we can expect him to judge, and he judges according to his character, and that character is actually expressed in the law. So his character of God is holy and righteous, and in the law he has shown that sin is accompanied by guilt, and for that there is condemnation. Now, we can go into a whole lot more detail, which the unit does a little bit, but that's basically my summary. That little diagram right there. Character of God is holy and righteous, therefore sin leads to guilt, leads to condemnation. So you can't go as far as on character. He cannot be not holy, he cannot be he cannot be unjust, yes. So does exactly. sin always lead to guilt? Yes. That's why there is guilt and condemnation. But how does a person know that they they have guilt? You're well, guilty or you sin, you're sin, you're guilty. Well, you've got to know what sin is. That was part of the point of the law. Yes, I know, but if you outside the law, that was part of. Um, well, you look at Romans. Um, hey, Jackie is back. You mean like a Gentile? Yay! Yeah, yeah, We weren't sure if you're still in Vic or not. No, I'm driving back from Beachwood yesterday. Got back last night. Ah, praise the Lord! <laughs> praise the Lord! <laughs> Welcome. Sorry, we're just, um, yes, we are looking at God's justice and justification. And my starting point is simply sin leads to guilt, leads to condemnation, because that is who God is. That's his character. He's always righteous. He's always holy. He's always just. So, yes, whether they know it or not, they're still guilty. Yes. So it's not the guilt is what they have. Not necessarily what they feel. Absolutely. So, and that is not just shown in the New Testament, that has always been the case. Um, Exodus 23 do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits, have nothing to do with a false charge, and do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not acquit the guilty. That has been a constant price. Um, and that's really the worst possible news for those who know themselves to be under condemnation that their sin deserves. Um, and yet, God makes it clear in his word that he is determined to rescue people for himself, despite that. So how can this be achieved in the face of our guilt and condemnation? Does his commitment to save just trump his commitment to being righteous? Hopefully the answer is a resounding no. It's not just I won't set aside, just ignore it because I really want you people to be mine. Please God cannot do that. Please. Oh, they're, they're here. And that takes us to the very heart of the gospel. Um, Romans 3, 25-26. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood 
to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So he's just and the one who justifies. And so um, the reformers described um, this as the biblical truth which gives shape to all other biblical truths. Um, but was also one of the points of theological debate which led to the Protestant and Roman Catholic division during the 16th century. So, for example, we are going to get a quote from Martin Lutero, or Martin Luther, as we call him. I'm not sure how you'd say that in German, maybe. Maybe Luther. Luther. <laughs> Luther. <laughs> he said, the article of justification is the chief and foremost lord, rule and judge over all the variety of doctrines. It's pretty huge. It preserves and governs all church doctrine and encourages our conscience before God. That's a pretty big claim. Um, but now at the heart of disobedience is unbelief. And unbelief also is disobedience. So, I mean, even we saw Adam and Eve, uh, the heart of the fall was a refusal to accept God's direction for life, a failure to trust. They didn't, believe, they didn't trust in um, God's word. They didn't trust that God's word was good and a blessing. And so disobedience and unbelief have always been linked right from the start. And yet we've got to remember that even though original sin affects the whole of humanity, we are still accountable for our sin, even though that's just who we are. So... Thinking about the, the two key players of Cain and Abel, would that be applicable to them individually, let alone when they get together and they come up with that solution? Yeah, absolutely. A good quote from. Um, so good pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so another good quote uh, from the book this time The law was given to saved people. Okay. The law was given to saved people, not to all people so that they could be saved. They were already saved to show them how to respond in gratitude to the God who had saved them. It wasn't so much a legal code as it was a means of instructing the redeemed people of God um, in a life of blessing. So although not sin, not all sin is a conscious transgression, as we're saying, of a uh, law that's published, um, there is a consistent link between the knowledge of God's will and the standard of God's judgment to the law made known through Moses. Uh, Moses. See, Moses. Those who know more are better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've got yeah, they've got more. It's clear. But then God also says, "No one is without excuse." So your person doesn't understand. He's guilty of it. Understands. Done something. He's still guilty. Still guilty, but not as well. The, yeah, well, um, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, that's the he understands it, though, he doesn't get it. Yeah, but I think the point of the quote was pretty much that it wasn't the law wasn't given just so you could follow it. The law was given to people who had already been rescued to say this is what God is like. This is how you have to live in response. So that's yep. why somebody like Rahab was blessed. It was extraordinarily. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Because she had faith. She didn't have the law because she was a Jew. Oh, but she was a God figure. Yeah. And she went, I'm going to trust in him. That's... Mm -hmm. So that's why she's an example, a good example. Hey, Helen, welcome. Okay, uh, where are you? So basically the law that was given to Moses, or what they often call the Mosaic law, we're not talking tiles here, um, <laughs> we're talking the law given to Moses, it both revealed the will of God and the sinfulness of the people. Um, oh, 
the people who are incapable of obeying it. Yeah. But it also made clear the consequence of sin, condemnation, and death. And the sacrificial system actually highlighted the seriousness of disobedience and unbelief. Uh, and that forgiveness was costly. Um, we're pretty, yeah. Praise be to God, we don't have to go through all that kind of thing because it was very bloody and messy and in your face and smelly. But it hammered home the costliness. So, uh, under the mosaic law, the fact that the offerings had to be repeated made clear also that the ultimate solution to forgiveness lay elsewhere. How good is the book of Hebrews? If there's one thing you're going to remember is how good is the book of Hebrews? Okay, so and in Romans, Paul insists that Gentiles have no excuse for being guilty um, of sinning against God. The law expresses the perfect will of God for human beings, and to live against that will is failing to live up to God's standard. And the fact that none of us can keep that perfectly means that none of us could possibly stand before God's judgment seat and be declared innocent on our own merits. Well, page 147 says this, so it's thinking of Romans 1, 18, 3, 20. The prophets speak of the judgment of God to fall upon the nations because the things they have done are considered to be sins against God. For example, in Isaiah 47 or Habakkuk 2, it is clear that all are expected to live according to God's will, whether or not they are part of the privileged nation of Israel who possess the Mosaic law. Well, um, So we're looking at um, God as the one who is just, and yet because he is perfect, um, he also justifies. So God is both the one who is just and the one who justifies, but we are seeing that all fall short of the glory of God. And we've also, we started by saying sin means guilt, which means condemnation. Uh, and that's the way it is because God is perfect and he cannot not be who he is. So that's where we're at. But it is a great time to open the Bible together, I believe, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> no, Michael said there wasn't anyone coming to me. Sorry. <laughs> Michael saw me after church and yeah, he was doing it. He's telling me off. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, it? It's a bit of a line-up. So, um, wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so we've already had Romans um, chapter 1 to a few times. I thought we'd look more closely at I do think we have a common theme for tonight. Um, so, uh, just the way that Romans begins is he introduces himself as the apostle who's not been to Rome. He expresses in verse 8 through to 15 really that he really wants to go to Rome and uh, be mutually encouraged by them. And then he's, he sort of um, sort of leaps into his gospel presentation in verse 16. So, Lewis, do you mind reading for me? Yeah, um, just starting with you. Yeah, um, those are verses 16 and 17 in my Okay, Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will be faith. Yeah, thank you very much. So I've got a question there. What is revealed in the gospel and how does it work? Yeah. Well, the righteousness of God. Good, yes. That's the comprehension. Part. What does that mean? <laughs> Sorry, I had to ask, please. I mean, I'm the same with this one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Christ is what I would say that's what's revealed, and yes, picking up on time, that is the righteousness. Yes, yes. being holy. Um, 
holy in his response to God. You know, that's the commandment that Jesus is God. Right. It's it's the holiness that he displays in responding to the expectation. Okay. And also that it's a righteousness by faith, not by keeping the law. Okay. So I was going to say, I, I've got to hear how does it work, but I'm going to say how does it work for our salvation? And, and Jackie, you said it's by faith. Did you refer to the law? Yeah, it's by faith, not by Not by law. Yeah, that's right. So when it says, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Oh, yeah. So who is saved by the gospel? That's my next question. Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. Yep. Or? All those who have faith. Everybody who has faith, yeah, or everyone who believes. So just remember that the word um, believes is sort of in the Greek is another form of the word faith, right? It's just so in English they translate it with the word? multiple different words. Well, the word believes. The word, yeah. To, because we don't hope we see the same word over and over again. But when you when you think about that, there is a lot of emphasis here on the word on the idea of belief and faith, mm -hmm. right? But I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first from the Jew and then from the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith. Sorry, I was just trying to get ahead of what you said before. So it reads if it was to translate directly from the Greek, yeah, you'd read faith again. Yeah, I understand, that's how I understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That faith has something that you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith from first to last, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So um, we're going to come back to that phrase of righteousness from God, which is being revealed. Um, is it? Well, the way, the way Romans goes from here is it sort of. Verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness. And he, he, he lays out the charge against humanity. In, verse, in chapter 2, you therefore have no excuse you to pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you do pass on judgment, do the, pass judgment on others, do the same things. And then he starts, then, he, then in verse 17, 2, verse 17, now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, you know his will and approve of what is superior because you were instructed by the law. If you are convinced that you are a guide of the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? And he goes on to say, Jews are actually condemned also, even though they have the law, they do the same things. So let's pick up again from um, 3 verse 19, 3 verse 19 and 20, really the conclusion of that section, and then in Proverbs 21, we're going to have the but now, which is good news. Uh, Jose, do you mind reading what 3 verse 19 through 3 26? 3 26. Uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that Every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Thanks very much. So just before I go into the questions that I've written down, I just wonder, does anybody want to come up and 
meaning of the words that it quite explains the dance passage. Um, forbearance. Uh, yeah. So it's the idea of patience, the idea of, of bearing with. Um, so in the phrase, uh, what did it say? In his forbearance, he had left the sins of men born and unpunished. So he kind of bore with them. So what with them? Bore with them. Um, uh, sort of endured them. Does that mean the people before Christ do you get punished for them? Yes. Not, yes, not all. <laughs> That's right. It's so, it, 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 I mean, it, the, the, the call of the Psalms, for example, is why do the unjust rule? Why do they get away with it? And that is the character of the world that we now we see is that some people go to the grave without being rewarded. I take it that his forbearance is more that he didn't just wipe every humanity off the face of the earth. Yeah. Thank you. So in their sins before Christ, he, you know, in his patience with them, he didn't just go, oh, look, I'm done. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna end humanity because none of you deserve it. Um yeah, that's what I'm thinking he's he's talking about. So he's, but that means he was still have forbearance now. Absolutely. Um that's why Jesus hasn't returned. That's the way I take it. So is is God frustrated in his forbearance? I don't know. <laughs> he's purposeful. <laughs> yes, I know his purpose. No, he has a plan. And two Peter three, we 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 saw we didn't actually cover the passage directly last week, but I think that two Peter three was the passage where it talks about his patience means so happy. So it's sort of it's a decided thing. See, because I would be frustrated. <laughs> well, I know because the, the jury he has with faithfulness of his son, mm. but before that, it's this you know, I want to wipe them out. And we're sort of seeing, I know, no, I can't remember that. So my brain is going on, I can't quite pin the words, but it, it well, it's against his character, yes, for sin to not be punished, isn't it? And forbearance, where it's that he's um, putting out, yeah, he's restraining himself, but there's this Sorry. building, there's this building, um, emotive aspect. I'm not sure if emotive is the right word, but um, yeah. Am I sort of not my Well, when you are, when you say the word frustrating, it's frustrating for me to do things. I know, this is where I'm sure. Yeah, well. So, so the sense of frustrated where he's been incapable. Yeah, right? his plans are not frustrated. I think he's talking more emotion, emotion. Yeah, yeah. than plans being frustrated. Yeah. Yes. He knows what we're like. And he's had to deal with it for thousands of years leading up to the joy yeah. we can have and the sun being a demonstration. And I'm pretty sure he didn't want to have to put up with it. It would have made us different. Yeah. Or ended it a long time ago. No. Yeah. But but if, but I think God's able to span back the time yeah. and say from the beginning to the end. Um, the, you know, he knew about the cross. Yes. Yes. For justice. Yeah. Is that a bit of now but not yet? God as well. Yes. I mean, it's interesting, a light bulb moment just came to me. We talk about now, not yet, but for God having to wait for the Son to defeat sin and death. Yeah. But he doesn't, he's absent from time. Yeah. yeah, I know, but it means that he's still inside time having to wait. <laughs> but he has to wait too because it's. it's no, not if he's outside. Okay, now that really is doing right. it. Yeah. You're right. I'm You're still absolutely. Over <laughs> your opening statement about the Jews were given the law, but they were already saved. So the law was there to make them conscious of how impossible it was to keep it. So they weren't saved from sin, but they were already a rescued people from slavery in Egypt. Yes, they were. So it's like I've redeemed you already. This is how redeemed should live. So it's 
So all those sacrifices that they yep. gave. Yes. Are we saying that that didn't save them? No, that, that didn't save them because they've already redeemed and chosen. But what it did was maintain their relationship with them. Yes. Okay. They gave their faith back to God. Mm. It maintained their faith. Well, so to speak, so to speak yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was how God could stand to be in their presence because mm -hmm. the sin was paid for in the sacrifices. Yeah. Okay, so um, does anybody have a different question or uh, want to talk about? What the words mean before we progress to my question. Uh, all right. It sounds it just it just actually that left was I was left thinking that um, there might be a whole lot of questions from what Gary had said that we haven't addressed. So we should probably have a a, a loose time at the end where we open it up. Um, okay, so what does the law achieve in this passage from verse 19 to 26? What does the law achieve? What does it fail to achieve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but I'm asking about the law. It's in the law in the sense that it's puts people in that way, right? In the sense that it's no God's asking. Right. But if they're going to be righteous and free, then they lost now. I thought righteousness and faith was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> God made them conscious of their sin, but it didn't say that. Yeah, so people who weren't familiar with the law, yeah, that's still an issue. Even though they're not familiar with the law, they're still, uh, they're still conscious of their sin, even though they don't realize they. So, so for a person without the law, you might be conscious of your sin, or you might suppress the knowledge of that. But when you've got the law, it becomes more difficult to to do that. And you're not understanding. Yeah. Yes. You're already in a really low standard. Okay. That first starts. Um, it says to those who are under. Right. Yes. But so that, and the whole world held accountable. Yes. So the whole world is not under the law. Yes. So how does how does that work? Well, we, we didn't read all of chapter one, um, but chapter one sort of starts out talking about humanity generally and says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and weakness of people who suppress the truth by their weakness and goes on to idolatry and not giving thanks and not glorifying God. So though all of those things are generally applicable. From the perspective of the Jewish reader, it's easy to accept that the Gentiles are condemned. Mm -hmm. So the Jewish reader, it's a hard thing to understand is, oh, well, hold on, I've got the law and I've tried to follow it. That's the hard thing to understand. So when he says in 3 verse 20, we you know what the law says, it says to those who are under the law, what he's saying is the Jews are always low, are condemned. Because the law is addressed to them, speaking to them. And he's just had, you know, four or five different quotes which say there is no one righteous, not in one, there's no one understands. So he's saying this this law condemns. Its recipients, um, the rest of the world already be. And you can't live up. And you can't live up to the law. Yeah. That's right. So in verse um, yeah, so that so just to continue there, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world be held accountable to God. That's right. Therefore, no one will be declared where. Okay, so I want to actually go back to my question. What does the law fail to achieve? Righteousness. Okay. Salvation. Salvation. What did you mean by righteousness? Well, you can't be a proper standing before God. Yeah. Through the law. Yeah. Why not? There's no completeness to it. Because it's, it's not by what you do. 
Okay. Oh, close. Uh, so it's actually just to um, the law, you may address the law the day before tomorrow. Okay, yes. So it's this repetitious cycle. Does it tend to be like two dollars a ten? The day of the law will be ten instead of one. Okay. So the law makes it so see, You see it in the law, I've got the same thing. I mean, you can see that break to the. Yep. Okay. Yes, particularly our model. Three basic ones. Well, you're talking about the more general Well, any sort of board, the Ten Commandments or whatever. If the first one is so easily broken, that we can talk about it. Yes, I think uh, I think we we just uh, take that in mind. Yeah, what is it again? Well, I think that's it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm very conscious of the as a common group. You know, but I think the close friend who just convinced us just to know. He's totally convinced that he's a good man because just because I can see because I keep the law. And there's so many things I need to do wrong, which is nothing much worse to do with any sort of um, so, so, so I guess what we can't do, we can't provide us, we can't be saved. We can't be so saved. Um, so verse 23, for all have sin, sin and the short of the glory of God. Right? There's no difference. Oh, what difference is there between the Jew and the Gentile? <laughs> 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 there would be none, Jeremy. <laughs> But that's yeah, that's right. That's right. So, is it is it does it improve your standing to be held to a higher standard? No, it makes it worse. Yeah. <laughs> now, since Jesus, there is no difference between the Jew and Gentile. They're all in the same boat, so to speak. We're all um, judged by our acceptance. And trust of Jesus as our representative. Mm. So there is no difference in that. And also, it's a question that sometimes, uh, you know, I reckon you could refer to the uh, Christians who, in the Vietnam War, in serving God, God and law, broke the law. Yeah. Conscientious. Conscientious objectives. Yes. Uh, because they felt they were serving God rather than the law. Yes. And they were saying, look, we pay God. But then we need to remember sometimes, yeah. We don't agree with that. Okay, be prepared to get judged. Sure, but it, it's just, it's just because the Australian government don't have to live on God's law. Of course they don't. That's right. Whereas Moses did. But I think even, you know, but even Moses' law was God's law. That's the point. That's when Christ came, in the new covenant, it, it may, you know, it, even though it came out of Moses' law, it, it, it went beyond that. Um, it fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled all of the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. And in that, we are seen under the law of Christ, which is I mean, believe and trust in Him. And, and yeah. I mean, this, Moses is one of the great lawgivers of history. Uh, I reckon this is an interesting. Any of us back who didn't grow up in a you know, Israelite society bound by the Mosaic law. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is it becomes complicated. Well, the Old Testament laws are really just two love the Lord your God with all your heart and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And these two commandments and all the law of the prophets. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, the quotes. you know, they really are just, I know we start itemizing to get to 10. Yeah. But up in, this, in essence, it's about putting out the kids and being God's law. What should we have? And I'm thinking, I'll just start this. Who's going to go? I'm just sitting. Fuck, giddy up. Who's going to go? 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 
it's up education. Because mm. it is an education to your children to convert to Christianity. And uh, it's really interesting to start talking about the law. Mm. And the way that it became, it just dominates. Mm. Yeah, that's what you're saying. We miss out. We forget that. Yeah. So there's two fundamental rules. Yeah. And then it can for this, all for that. Yeah. 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 Also, in a way, because Jesus said it's not just doing that, it's teaching the other. Yes. Yes. It's, okay. It's well, even, I mean, even the prophets were saying that. Oh, I don't want your sacrifice or your heart. Yeah. That's what God was saying. So, next question How in this passage, I'll look right to you. Point to a verse. Uh, how are people justified before God? Just point to a verse. <laughs> Here you go. Verse 24, 38, apart from it. You can explain that to us as well. <laughs> no, you just said point to a verse. Actually, it's exactly what I said. A literal response. <laughs> but my follow up question is could you explain that, please? Mm -hmm. This is, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. But I mean, the old classic line is just about the loss. Uh -huh. It sounds like it you know, makes it easy, but because it is. Hands on God's grace. Right. Hands on God's grace. So, verses 24 and 25 spell out the fact that Jesus' death on the cross, the shedding of his blood, was the ultimate sacrifice that we could. We couldn't do. It was the sacrifice to end the war. Yeah. So, what does it mean for us to be justified? You see, do we say, yeah? I think just because does it, does it, so, if I said I'm justified by God, is it saying, is it an evaluation that my, my performance is now recognized? No, no, no. So what what does it mean? What would you say? It's it's to be just Christ, that you should receive. Right. Yeah, so we should accept that. Okay. I'm just thinking you're okay. I might, I might be a little bit of a little bit. Yes. So, so at what point is Jesus um, get in trouble? At what point was Jesus righteous? Was it fulfilling what was expected, or was it ultimately dying under the direction of his father? Or was it because he was God? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that's that's. Yes, because you don't find you wouldn't get you don't see in the uh, the Ten Commandments the reference to that that you should die and die on the cross. Yeah. But you but that was to, obedience. That's the issue. Working. That's right. So that's the notion: mm -hmm. is the obedience aspect, which is the, uh, the righteousness in fulfilling the Father's will. Yeah. But because he was in very nature God, he couldn't but be obedient. So yes, both. Yes. And we, we see throughout the Bible that those who sin die, except those that by grace of God are forgiven. I think if you think about my first little diagram from the start, sin, guilt, condemnation, being justified means you're working backwards. Mm -hmm. You're not condemned because Jesus has taken the guilt for our sin. Yeah. But also in the the earlier chapters where we really honed in on the fact that if Jesus hadn't been resurrected bodily, then there would not have been any of those things. It would it, it would not have been. Yeah. He died under God's condemnation, but then he rose. God's grace. Redemptive sins. Yeah, that is God. As long as you're repeating. 
Oh, that's good. Is that a good downside? <laughs> no. No, that's okay. Remember the law? Yeah. God saved him and said, This is how you live. We'll get next week to election. Oh, no, I saw that. That was funny. So, it's too hard. God saved us so we can respond and we do respond because God has saved us, yes. So, in verse, um, in, in the verse earlier, we saw how the righteousness that was being revealed. And when we come to this passage, this idea of the righteousness is actually quite common. So verse 21. But now apart from the law, and now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. And then verse 22, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now it also appears in verse 25 and 26 where it says um, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Right? And in verse 26 he did it to demonstrate his righteousness. Why does God need to demonstrate his righteousness? He helps us in this. Okay, he helps us as he is to understand, right? It's more, there's more to it than that. If you read verses 24 Right. So, so, so it doesn't, something had to happen just to say, we're on the righteousness of harm you, that we're not sin anymore. Yes, some of the righteous sin has occurred, but it's something that's to be that. Okay. Thank you, Tane. Sin, guilt, condemnation. If you don't want to be condemned, something has to do with guilt. See, okay, if I was to, if I was, I'm going to say to you, um, God need, needs to demonstrate his righteousness because he looks unrighteous. God looks unrighteous. Okay, so what do you mean by look? Is that um, right. mm -hmm. addressing forward, addressing <laughs> back? Because, because I, I, sorry, go, Jackie. Because it appears that sin has gone unpunished. Exactly. To who? When, to humans. All of the heavenly realms. So Glenn's right. Verse 25. Uh, what does it say? Because Jesus forbearance and death was seen to commit and beforehand that was unpunished. So actually, if you just look at the world right now, I mean, let's just say you're an atheist for a moment. You look at the world, all the suffering that there is, the cruelty, the violence, the brutality. And I tell you about this God who will not quit the guilty. Can there be any God? No. There, there can't be that kind of God, the righteous God, because people get away with it. Get away with it. Now, why hasn't he sort of um, sent down a lightning bolt? Who, yeah. Exactly. My question is that. Yeah. Why, why is he allowed that? That's the question. Yes, I'm not saying this. I've never seen a world before. Ever. David talks about regularly the Psalms. Why does God and our suffering really play so much? Well, the decisions you make about God and our suffering that he has to believe in. So, a lot of you know. Yeah, uh, it, it's a good question. No. One, of, one, of the, one of the psalms that I, I read as a teenager, it's a really hard time, and it was David calling out saying, I see them, they're wealthy, they, they eat, drink, they're merry, and here I am suffering. And then the last verse goes, but then I perceived the end. And I think, yeah, that's, that's really powerful. Mm. Um, that, that maybe that time. Yes, I think what we don't yeah. understand, none of us understand, none of us really wants to understand. What does God really say? Mm. Um, I mean, this, the problems we go through are nothing exactly. compared to the majority of the world. 
So, um, God needs to demonstrate his righteousness because he's not to live righteously. What Paul's saying in the passage is that he has now delivered a righteousness. And it's a righteousness that perfectly marries the two objectives that he's got, that is, being holy, just, perfect, but also of keeping, loving, saving people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And the, the, the one way, he says, by his grace, through the redemption, that came by Christ Jesus, God, who died for me, has been sacrificed on the throne through the shedding of his blood. So Jesus is, is kind of the solution to God's problem, if you like, the problem of his unrighteousness. So, I wanted to sort of play to that a little bit because it is the thrust of what Paul's revealing us through the text. And, um, you know, it's sort of also coming back to what I was saying before. I don't think we fully understand the punishment that Jesus has gone through. So, that sense of suffering, we don't understand the, the Jesus perspective about what that means. And it's almost like we don't know what we can say to God. Which is, that's right. Yes. We have an interesting discussion to use that. The start of that is, and one of the biggest made the point, which I thought we not talk about this a lot, but you remember our Lord of God, who had been Sunday school, who had been near a church for ages. You see, it's a really good question. Why do we think we're inside the box of Sunday? Why do we think we're entitled to what we perceive to be the good life? We should be grateful every day to wake up. It's good question. That, you know, that for so many things, God is here. But it's actually the best answer to why it's going around suffering. Yeah. We all, everyone seems to think that we're entitled to be free of suffering. Yeah. Okay. And that kind of, you know, that kind of, they can have stuff for it. It's a really deceptive problem. And it made me think about it. But we start with the assumption that we have to serve and suffer. Yeah, I think yeah. that brings us, that brings the uh, stumbling block. It brings the angst to the whatever because and we should even people who don't believe in God don't understand their own suffering. It's not it's not a religious thing. No, it's not religious. You get a lot of answers. I'm just trying to find a book that I've read about all this. I can't remember the author, I've still got the time, but it was called The Beauty and the Horror. Oh, wow. It was written by a Anglican minister, also worked for the British Council of Literature. So it's full of a lot of literature references, but it's biblical references. But he talked about we get obsessed with the horror, we forget the beauty. Mm -hmm. um, all those lovely things that we just take for granted. So I think I was just one last night. But it was really interesting. Really. Just um, one last question from the passage. What is our role in our justification? Uh, the point is it. <laughs> well, because, just, because we are only <clears throat> What would you say from the passage? What was your Richard Harris? Richard Harris. Who what, Richard Harris wrote. That's it. That's it. That's the one. I think I was looking for Richard Harris in the passage. Yeah, I was gonna, was, <laughs> what I'm going to say, Tony, is uh, this righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus Christ to all who believe. Yes, I was going to say verse 22. Yeah. I, I think I'm not going to tease things out further because I think it will. Well, we'll see. There's a whole lot of <laughs> distinctions. There are a whole lot of distinctions that we need to actually um, <clears throat> have a look, quick look at. So, the first one is we are justified because we are united to Christ, or as we say, as Paul says, in Christ um, by faith. Um, so, 
Yeah, we'll get to what that means in terms of righteousness. But what it does mean is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because remember, sin, guilt, condemnation, no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus because he took the guilt. Yeah. Um, a way of expressing that that was made popular during the Reformation was to say that those who are united by who are united with Christ by faith are clothed in an alien righteousness. Basically means a righteousness that's not their own, but it's given to them by another. Not extraterrestrial. Like that question is actually in the the quizzes. Oh, is it? Yeah, like one of the options is no, it doesn't say extraterrestrial, but it's <laughs> off this planet or something okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we need to take care in expressing how we are justified so that our faith does not become a work that earns our forgiveness. Right, just run that past me again. I think I, I We need to be agree. careful to expressing that we are clothed in an alien righteousness so that our faith of itself doesn't become a work that earns our salvation. Is that because it then becomes a boast? It becomes a boast, it becomes a work. It becomes a work. Yeah. 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 Which doesn't, which isn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because, which is why we already started with the faith that binds us to Christ is a gift from God, which is why we've already gone through the role of the Holy Spirit and the call and the effectual call. The, act, the faith in Christ that binds us to Christ and makes us in Christ is in itself a gift from God. So it's not a work, so that no one can boast, as Paul says in Ephesians. And that, um, yeah, anyway, little quote. In an unfathomable, in an act of unfathomable love, Jesus Christ has given himself to us so that what is ours, sin, guilt, condemnation, becomes his. What is his, righteousness, holiness, and life, becomes ours. Um, Martin Luther and other reformers called this the wonderful exchange. Uh, I, I, had, I had a friend who was doing ministry in TAFEs and he said Jesus did a trade. Yes. Because yes. that's that whole issue of don't buy the scars. Mm. Yep. Yeah, it's not something that himself it's a It's not a common trade. No. <laughs> he doesn't actually give up his righteousness. No. He doesn't. He just takes on ours as well and makes his available for us, yes. But basically, uh, the sanctions of the law have been exhausted at the cross. Yes. So totally paid for at the cross. Uh, but the wonder of this exchange is that Jesus is treated the way we deserve to be treated and we are treated the way he deserves to be treated, which is why people would go, justification, I'm justified just as if I am and sin because we are treated the way Jesus should be treated. It's pretty different to think the way Jesus was treated. Yes. The way we be treated. Yes. Which is why the Old Testament had the sacrifices because they made this is costly. The sacrifice for sin is bloody and ugly and horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so by Christ fulfilling... Uh, all that the Lord demanded for those uh, who are in him, God has made Jesus our righteousness. And so he can be both just, he maintains his justice, but he's also the one who justifies. Yeah. Anyway, it's, yeah. Oh, it's just more. This all makes it very difficult <laughs> to understand. Yeah. But, and, you know, we've come here to be challenged. That's good. Yes. And I, I'm very grateful to be challenged and all that sort of thing. But what's important when you explain all this to a non Christian and you've not come across any of this before? We don't need to explain all this. I know, no. exactly. So, are um, we in danger of making it a little more hot, too complicated for the use? Uh, no, because if we really want to, um, plumb the depths 
of like because the more you dig, the more incredible it becomes. Yes, yes. Um, And so that, as I was saying, so sort of actually serves to build us up and encourage us. Yeah, not, yeah, not and gives us more confidence. It is. So it's good to go deeper and deeper. And it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, just, uh, and, and and so you may come across a deep philosophically thinking non-believer or even Jew. And so to have done the hard work, you will be prepared to be able to give an answer yeah, for what you believe rather than just a shallow answer. So we need to, without being simplistic, we need to make our proclamation accessible and simple enough in that sense, but have all that stuff underneath. Um, it actually takes more effort to make something complex simple than just have something simple. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and, and I guess that's the issue, isn't it? You're providing an answer to a person in the back, you're not looking at the interaction. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. So we're um, justification in this sense is God's judicial declaration that we are not guilty, that we are right with Him because of Jesus' life. And work. Now we've got to be careful not to say that Christ makes us righteous. Because that sounds as if we have a righteousness of our own that has been given to us. It's been given to us, but I am righteous. Rather than being clothed in Christ's righteousness. You see the difference? The difference is between imputed and imparted. Um, or, or one way they say is reckoning righteousness to us or crediting to us Christ's righteousness. So Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, not imparted, making us in ourselves righteous. Well, I think we're talking about it as being clothed. Yes. Yeah. Clothed. Yeah. Yeah. And they also need to be careful. So you've got to keep working on your um, keep your righteousness. Yeah, but but in that, yeah, but in that sense, even um, the the reckoning of righteousness is God's decision based on something other than our performance. So it's not coming from yeah, so no flesh. Perhaps it's actually this is like the perfect self preparing items or something. Like that. <laughs> the, the the clothes that never wear out. Yeah, yeah. Being close, and you can't take off the Yeah. 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 That's when you This is why we also need to read this Hebrews. The book of Hebrews talks about this as well. Um, and yeah, so it's in the book of Hebrews, yeah. So well, in the book of Hebrews, there are warnings. Yeah, yeah. 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 We wrote after the last day. No, they could come back again. Yeah. Well, yeah. So God, and there's yeah. many reasons why they do that. Um, but I know that. Uh, oh, we should be able to read this. Michael, I mean, my son Michael, yeah. haven't come out of all five years. Yeah. Yeah. Three, but they were trained in the system. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Three. Three. And you know, I was at all. They're the three. And you know, the ones he's close to. So the ones he's close to. And, it's quite dramatic, uh, and it really affected him quite a lot. Mm. I was really proud of the way he dealt with it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it just happens because yeah. But also, you've got to you've got to then wonder were they wearing the emperor's new clothes? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Where were they truly clothed? Ever or were they 
Yeah, well, they just because because it, when you get to Hebrews, it talks, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hebrews, yeah, yeah. people can taste and see. No, yeah. And if they're walking away, who's to say that God hasn't got them and dragged them back? Well, that's right. Yeah. So again, yeah. because the parable of the sower mm. basically says it's only those who receive the word, like good soil. Good soil. The others, well, a couple of the others receive it, and they well, it may appear like they're growing. Yes. Okay. Um, Brendan has a quick question. About yes. With justification. So that's like uh, I've heard the um, the analogy of like a guilty person going to court, and then the judge says, so, "You know, someone else pays the fine for you, and then you're released." So, but like, I sometimes have trouble understanding that analogy because. Just say, for instance, I've been lack of support, and then someone steps in his place, an innocent person steps in his place and says, I'll take his punishment. So I've been lack and can walk free, and then the innocent person goes to jail. What I find hard to, to comprehend is where's the justice there? Like, how can that be? How can that, how can that be justice? Someone innocent. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't like that illustration. I would, if I was going to use that illustration, I would say that then the judge says guilty, walks down and pays the fine himself. So it's more like the judge is both being just, but also the one who is saying, I will take it for you. I heard a similar analogy. You know, so rather than, so the, the judge is the one who then takes the punishment. That, that's a better analogy, yeah, but, I think. That's, I've got trouble with that. Where's the justice there? The well, the justice, justice is, the justice is the guilt is being paid for. That's what creates it. It's in there. Yeah. Well, it's not in there. 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 It's not Someone said that was an injustice. Someone innocent taking the place. And then this is one of the important points. It, it, I mean, when you get offended at the injustice thing, that's when you understood it from. Yeah. I mean, Barabbas. Because Jesus. Yeah. We, we, we are guilty and we don't have anything to offer. Yeah. And we are declared righteous. And so if that's sort of, there is an offense to that and it should be offensive. Yeah. yeah. Just because it is a matter of like salvation being this, this justification being a gift to people who don't deserve it. And and I think when we think of these kind of illustrations, we always think we are an innocent one standing by watching, but actually we're the one standing before the judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um that we understand an injustice, but that's an injustice that I benefit from. And there have been important cases in history where Someone has stepped in and taken the death of some other person. Oh, yeah. yeah. But what I'm saying is that how can that be considered justice? When the, when the guilty walks away. Yeah, I don't think it's justice. I think that's justice. Well, um, it, will, yeah. it is merciful, but it's just in that the guilt has not gone and punished. It's, it's not even solved. Um, the price has been paid. As they say, um, but yes, it's just not by the person who's supposed to pay the price, mm -hmm. and we're supposed to understand that, mm -hmm. and that that is that's where grace comes from. And, and like, yeah, your sin is punished on Jesus on the cross, so there is justice because he mm -hmm. because he suffered, mm -hmm. um, and you're not left with your sin because he's righteous. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like. It's not fair. Yeah, it's not fair. It's not fair. That's, fair. Right. that's right. I mean, that's just human response. It's not fair. Yeah. It would be the ultimate innocent person of Christmas Christ. Mm. And that's exactly right. Yeah. It isn't fair. We don't get what you're yeah, mm. And so in our society, we have the right to think everyone should get what they deserve. 
Well, praise God, we don't get what we ask for. And that's the problem for God. So you're saying the whole injustice of the of this act is is God's grace yeah. to us. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not actual justice, it's the injustice that it's <laughs> well, okay. yeah, so he it's a, it's on us. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's up to him to take it upon himself. Mm. He who has been offended against, he who is the judge, uh, he's the one who has to take it upon himself. Which is why he so, who is both just and not just upon himself. Yes, that's right. Anyway. All right, I'm going to go into the next one because otherwise we won't have much of anything else. Um, when Paul speaks about being justified by faith, he never suggests that, therefore, faith is a grounds for our justification. Rather, our, we're always drawn to the redemption Jesus has won for us. So then what is the place of faith? Well, the important thing about faith is its object. It's who you trust. And the important thing is it is received, it is earned. Um, now, there are three objections, classic objections to justification by faith alone. Um, people would say it removes all incentive for godliness. And the Apostle Paul would say, in the original language, by no means. Um, that's one of the common objections. The other one is that faith... Um, should not be treated without its practical expression in acts of love. Um, so, yeah, yeah. But basically the objection seems to confuse the act of justification with the life that flows from it. So, yeah, it takes, yeah, acts of, acts of good works or, you know, in Catholic Church, other acts, they say, this is how you're justified. My understanding of it is works of Exactly. In the sense that they're not something you can no. say not to the person. Yes. Because it's created this in your mind. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they would then say, well, James seems to contradict Paul um, in saying in, in the role of faith, but Paul and James are dealing with different issues. Um, Paul's dealing with justification, whereas James is dealing with, well, that's a false faith because. It's not a true faith because nothing comes from it, you know. Um, it's he's, James isn't talking about what it means to be justified. He's talking about what it means to have true faith. So anyway, um, but um, if we think of Genesis 15, Abraham's faith is reckoned as righteousness. Um, it displays itself later on in chapter 22 in his obedience and his willingness to sacrifice Isaac. So he wasn't righteous because he trusted he was going to sacrifice Isaac. That's chapter 22. Chapter 15, he was... Well, no, but he trusted that God would provide. Yeah, yeah. Um, so nobody, even Luther himself, would deny the importance of good works and nobody denies the link between faith and good works. Um, but they're just saying justification is not by good works. Because as a classic quote, uh, the faith which alone justifies is a faith that demonstrates itself in the human arena by godliness of life. Or as they say, the faith, the faith which justifies, or the faith alone which justifies is never actually alone. There's something always follows. Yeah. Which is what Luther would say. No, no, this is John Calvin. This is one Calvin. He would say, it is therefore faith alone which justifies, and the faith which justifies is not alone. Only Calvin could say that. <laughs> and yeah. But we got 15 minutes left. That's three trying on this do you mind doing that for us? Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What then can we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited, credited to him in his righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that had by faith uh, that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to him. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who do not who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing by promise and worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Therefore, the promise comes by faith. So there may be, be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are faithful to the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, and God who gives life to the dead and calls them deep things of their life. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed. So became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, faith surpassed his body, which was good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not wait until he believed. For God had promised of God that he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited him as righteousness, his words. It was credited him for written not time, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for those who believe in him. He raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, raised to life for our justice. Thank you. Now, in those first verses, we, we have Paul moving to this. I mean, he's been talking about righteousness. How to be righteous through faith, and then he shifts suddenly to talking about Abraham. So yeah. I pose this question: Why is it important what Abraham discovered? Yeah. Um, there is a future. Oh my goodness. goodness! There is a hope for the future, right? Why does he want to go there, Lewis? Well, it goes there because I have to go all the way back to pre Jesus. Yes, and think of here's a bloke that's basically uh, living in a time period where you can look at Ham. So, yeah, that's when you want to Okay. And and Abraham the one that is promised you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Exactly. Not made righteous. Okay, this is very, this is a very important distinction. What does it mean to be credited? What does it mean to say? Credited to him as righteousness. Credited to him as righteousness. Yeah. What does that mean? Means they have right standing before God. 
different area. Consciousness is given to like mm. if you get a credit from a bank account, somebody's money into it. Yes. <laughs> and how is that? But different? it's different because it doesn't the money becomes yours, whereas the righteousness doesn't actually become mm. his righteousness. Yeah. <laughs> it's like being able to spend the money from someone else's bank account. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So how is it different to being made righteous? Uh, I should say, they being clothed rather than being righteous with you. Okay. Being not righteous. Okay. So I was made righteous and then you've gone through something to get to that stage. And the way credit to me is that you just take your money and something else. Yes. So the reason I'm teasing this out is because um, Gary had the words impartation and imputation on the screen. And we're saying imputation, that is Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. It's kind of given, made out. Whereas impartation would be the idea of making us to perform like you perform. But that makes us the righteous one and therefore perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really manifestly not true. Yeah. We don't all know. Oh, no. yeah, it's true. Okay, so there's a there's a big there is a big thrust in the in the notes on that idea of it's all about him. And he is an utterly reliable, tribal object for our faith. We can but without relying on him, without expressing faith in him, we have no righteousness. It's not as if it's been the righteousness has been given to us. So we yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I remember someone asking me if, you know, Jesus, if sorry, if Abraham was here, or if Abraham was around the time of Jesus, would he have been a follower? And the answer is <laughs> And it's because, yeah, God would have identified through Abraham by the spots to say, that's him. Yeah. Which is a bit like what Moses and Elijah is when Jesus becomes famous. Yeah. yeah. Jesus is actually the fulfillment of Abraham's yes, to Abraham. So, so that hence the credit to him is the fact that yeah. Identify. So what did Abraham discover? I'm going to gain. Yeah. It's a speed, but he believed God. Yes. It's more than he believed in God. He trusted God. He trusted God. He gave his promise. He gave his promise. That's yes. right. But the discovery is one step further from that. What is the implication of him trusting God? Well, that's the righteous. That he was righteous. Yes. That's right. That's the discovery. Verse five. Okay. Verse. Verse three. Their faith. Their faith is written in the scriptures. Abraham knows. Well, Moses tells you that. So this is a quote in verse three. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And Paul's telling us here that he that. that what do you know? I just wondered if you know, yeah. Abraham is actually aware of himself that that's something oh. that's been realized in late since Abraham. Don't know. Maybe not in those words. Just, sorry, just the word may not exist. Because it's the narrator in yeah. Genesis who tells him that he was credited to righteousness. Because yeah. you know, in Spanish, the word righteousness does not exist. You try teaching this. <laughs> Well, they either have justicia, which is justice, um, and, but that, and that's not quite the right thing, is it? So there's justicia, there's purity, there's holiness, but there's no righteousness. So we are so blessed to have the word to help us get our, our mind out of it. But mostly, I think it's translated as justicia, justice. And justice. Right. Which is very interesting. 
Which righteousness? Yeah. It sounds like it's a Catholic. Okay, so in verse 6, he goes on to David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God prayers righteousness apart from works. So, what did David say? Yes, that's what I read now. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed is the one who sinned the Lord will never come against them. That's from Psalm 23. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that uh, Paul sees that uh, speaking about having righteousness credited apart from works. Because it's a person whose sins are covered, a person whose sins the Lord will never count account against them. That's what it's righteousness apart from works. It's, it's interesting in that quote from Psalm 32, it's kind of like my bones were wasting inside me all day long because he actually understood yeah. his sinfulness and he turns to God and says, That won't be counted, thank you, praise be to God. Yeah, that's right. Sure. So he understands, he understands God's mercy from a point of he repents, so he understands the weight of his sin. So. Yeah. Sorry. And that's good. So why, so just to return, why is it important what Abraham discovered? Why is it important what David says on this point? Um, yeah. Because there's more to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Righteousness was a gift from God. Righteousness was a gift from God. I think, yeah. Mm. From the very beginning. Blessed is the one who's seen the Lord will never count the things that yes. yes. David knew all about sin. Mm. <laughs> I think I'll leave it there, Gary. It's about yeah. two minutes. Okay, two minutes then. Here's my conclusion. Um, one, two, three, four, what is it? Five points. Conclusion. <laughs> Um, justification by faith alone equals saved by Christ alone and nothing we have done. And praise the Lord, it's like that because it's secure. Um, because it's accomplished by God and not by me. Yeah. Second point in my concluding summary, um, justification by faith is ours by our union with Christ by faith. Third, our, all people must stand before the judgment seat of Christ and yet there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, it's interesting so I might just be adding some little tangent thing, but mm. everyone is judged, even Christians. Yes. Mm. I was going to say, condemn. We can't, we can't say that no one, we won't be judged. No, we won't be condemned. Yes. Um, yes. But yeah, anyway, that's just a little side because we always say judging is bad. We always, when we say you're going to be judged, we always think you're going to be condemned. Yeah. Well, that's what we deserve. Yeah, but, but, but that's just the connotation these days of judge, judgment. Oh. It's not a impartial, we see judgment, condemned. Well, no, no, we're going to stand, but we won't be condemned. Sorry. Just a little, one of my little hobby horses. Um, I have a few. But that, um, and that leads into the justice issue. It does. Yeah. It does. Um, and understanding this justification by faith meant for Lucy entering paradise. Or um, when Wesley understood justification by faith, he said his heart was strangely warmed. So there you go. But human pride has always found this doctrine offensive because surely I can be righteous. Yeah. Sure. I close with that That's sentence it. leading into the next year about yeah. yeah. election. Because <laughs> next week it's That's about election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. yes. It's very interesting screen and being able to see Jose and Jeremy. And nothing between them. <laughs> 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 That's the voice's name. Oh, yeah. so, okay. Not to avoid the age. All right. I think we should pray. Would somebody like to pray for us? Yes. Please. Thanks. Heavenly yeah, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his love and for his faithfulness. In our place. But we thank you that because of these things and the preservation of the that we are counted right.
just for the Got a place for that time. Amen. See you next week. Thank you, gentlemen.